All right. Today is Tuesday, June 6. This is a recap for the stock market activities today. And folks, I got a good one for you tonight. But before we start, hope everybody saw my options tutorial video about a butterfly spread. And of course, uh, per usual, as I was watching the video, and mind you, this is already after the video been released. I'm thinking to myself, oh my God, I forgot an important point that I should have said, but I didn't say. And this happens to me pretty much in every single video. But what I should have said in that video, the butterfly spread is there is a risk. If you use a butterfly spread versus a regular spread. And the risk here is, if we use the same example, July's expiration, butterfly spread for target. The risk becomes if the stock shoots up significantly higher in a short amount of time, and it's now trading above the 140 call, which is the body of the trade. Now, one of those legs from the body is already covered for. It's covered by the main leg. What about the other one? Sure, the insurance leg, the 145 in this case, will appreciate in value. And this will cover some of the cost of buying back the body or closing the trade entirely. But in most cases, you're still going to own a amount of money. So for example, in this case, let's say the stock is trading at 145, exactly, by June 16th. Now the 140 leg is worth five bucks plus one of those legs covered for by the main leg so no worries here but what about the other one it's now worth about six seven bucks you gotta buy that back the 145 calls the insurance might be worth one to two bucks so that's gonna knock you down to four to three bucks but you're still gonna owe some in buying back the spread in case it goes too fast too high so how do you avoid getting in this scenario professional traders who use butterfly spreads they roll them. So if they see target, for example, moving all the way to 139 really fast, what they do is they update the structure of the trade. For example, instead of the 140 becoming the body, they roll that up. So the main leg becomes the 140, the body updates to 145, and the insurance updates to 150. That's called rolling up. And it is an important strategy to avoid getting into the scenario where the body is now in the money and you're going to owe some to buy it back. You got to see it before it happens and you're going to start rolling up before you get into that scenario. Anyhow, any more questions, just let me know. Let's get down to business here, folks. And we start from down under. If you recall, the Bank of Australia said uh, mission accomplished, just like Jerome Powell. We're going to pause. It's over. Inflation is dead. And then next thing you know, all of a sudden, the Bank of Australia is raising rates again. And the reason is inflation, the moment they paused, Rived back higher, and I feel that Jerome Powell is falling into the same trap. So why does Mr. Powell insist on skipping this meeting when almost every piece of evidence around him says he should hike by 25 basis points? And we get, of course, to the tinfoil hat theories. Was it orders from Janet Yellen? Because she has to dump a deluge of treasuries worth over a trillion dollars in a short amount of time. Or is it because the Fed sees something about to blow up and they want to buy more time? I smell a disaster happening because it's going to be impossible for Jay Powell to communicate this with us. The question would be, why the skip? Why are you skipping? Is it something bad that you see? He's going to say, no, nothing is bad. The, the banking system is sound and resilient. So why are you skipping, Mr. Powell? With the jobs number so hot? With probably the CPI, that would be absolutely comical. If the CPI comes out hot next week, if the PPI comes out hot right before the meeting, the conference by Powell, that would be absolutely hilarious. Why are you opposing Mr. Powell? He will have absolutely no answer to that. It's going to be a mess, and he might end up freaking the stock market. We might see an epic sell-off because of this. I smell danger ahead. Disaster ahead, courtesy of Jerome Powell. When we look at Australia, for example, when people say, hey, you shouldn't be hoping for a recession. Actually, you should be hoping and betting on a recession. I'll tell you why. Are you enjoying this right now? In America, in Australia, in the UK, in Europe, all over the place. Real wages are down big when we count inflation. Are you enjoying living paycheck to paycheck? And if, God forbid, you lose your job, you're absolutely toast. You can't pay the mortgage. You can't pay the insane car payment you're paying right now. The rent, the grocery store bill. And I know what you're going to say, but in a recession, I might lose my job too. There's actually a higher probability that I'm going to lose my job. That could be the case. But if you've been smart, if you've been planning, if you did not waste money on useless shit that you don't really need, even if you lose your job, the beauty in a recession is prices go down big. Real wages become positive again. The purchasing power, believe it or not, improves for those who've been planning. And we can scoop assets at pennies on the dollar. We can get bargains out there. So you should be hoping 
for a recession. Recession is good. It's the end of the cycle. It resets the insanity that's been going on for the last 10 years plus. But you know what I hear from you guys all the time? You say, hey, Maverick, but a recession is not going to happen. I mean, I'm at the airport right now at Miami. It is packed. I'm at the uh, whatever resort, a cruise. It is packed. People all over the place spending money. How can we have a recession? Well, if you recall, I'm in team stagflation. I'm not in a recession right away. We only get into a recession if the Fed does the job or inflation does the job for them. But right now we are still in an inflationary environment. It's only becoming stagflationary because we have portions of consumers falling apart. The poor, the lower mid class, some of the affluent consumers are cutting back on spending. But that's because of a choice not to spend, not because they don't have the means. But I get what you guys are saying. I was traveling over the weekend, all over the place. Some expected, some not expected travel. But anyways, the airports are packed. And then we stopped at Vegas. I got a business there. And you walk around the casinos. It is insanity. There's people all over the place. There isn't a single blackjack table empty. And again, we walk and my wife says, how can we have a recession? I mean, look at look at all these people. It's a zoo. They're stampeding on top of each other. They're spending money all over the place, overpaying for shit. You know, Vegas charges uh, an oxygen fee for breathing and people pay that. A reminder, I used to work in the strip for a long time. And your question is... What was your observation before the Great Recession in 09? What did you see? The answer is, up to the last minute, casinos were bustling, business was hot, and then suddenly, customers stopped showing up. There were leading indicators that we knew about, that we tracked closely, and we knew that there were signs for trouble. But if you walk around the floor, you wouldn't see the problem at all. If you look at the gaming revenue, for example, all the way till 08, it was a tiny little drop when you contrast 08 to 07, but gaming revenue was still increasing. The casinos were busy. Then comes 09, gaming revenue drops from 12 billion to 10 billion. So that's a lagging indicator. And you folks tell me, hey, the airport is busy, or the cruise is busy, people all over the place. You're right, but all of these are lagging indicators. You know why? The airports are busy, casinos are busy, cruises are busy. Hotels are busy because folks still have jobs. If you looked at the presentations we've done in this show, you know that the unemployment rate is a lagging indicator. In every Fed hiking cycle, it's either the rate peaks first or inflation. It's a toss-up. There is no clear record in who tops first. But we have a clear record that the unemployment rate peaks later, sometimes years after the peak in Fed rates and inflation. So you're not going to start to see the airports empty and the casinos empty until the bomb has already dropped. Then you see the damage. And the reason is the unemployment rate is always, always a lagging indicator. Now let's talk about the market a little bit because we have some activities. You know, the SEC is waking up from the coma right now and they're flexing their muscles on the tulip market, not the actual stock market, the equities market, where the majority of fraud is happening. But again, fraud in the stock market benefits the oligarchs. So of course, the SEC is not going to regulate and punish. The tulip market, it's mostly the mom and pops, a bunch of tulip billionaires here and there. So it's easy to crack down. There is no political backlash. And yesterday we got a crackdown on Binance. Today we're getting Coinbase. Initially, the stock went down big, but we saw a lot of dip buyers showing up and buying Coinbase. The reasoning behind that remains to be seen, but the technicals on the chart show a lot of damage. But was there any more damage in the equities market? Anything that we can notice as a sign for a reversal or a sign to be prepared that we're going to see a shift in tide? I released yet another midday update. Sometimes there is nothing to look at in the morning. We don't have any macro or economic news or any movement in the dollar or yields. So there is nothing new. There's nothing to talk about. So I issue midday updates instead. And you can pause this and read it for yourself, but in summary, it appears that today we've seen a different theme than yesterday. Yesterday it was defensive, it was recessionary. Yields were down, we saw healthcare up, we saw defensives up, we saw utilities up. Anything that pays dividend was higher. Today we see the opposite. Yields went higher and dividend paying names got punished. What shined instead is the rotation trade into the cyclicals, metals, industrials, banks. And the question now becomes, Maverick, are we seeing the rotation? Because you said if the rotation happens, that's bullish. The answer is it's not a rotation yet, it's allocation of capital. What is the difference? The difference is each month, money managers receive new inflows from clients, and they have to allocate these 
inflows into bonds, into stocks, into whatever they're investing in. In the last few months, it was pretty much buying the same, buying the big caps, buying the AI mania. This month, we're seeing something different, where the money managers are actually buying the laggards. They're buying the IWM small caps. They're buying the dip in banks with the assumption that Powell is going to pause, and the pause will be permanent and lead to cuts. They're buying industrials. They're buying metals. They're buying cyclicals. But they're not taking profits from the winners, the big caps, the AI mania. They're actually still buying dips in those. So you saw a lot of chip names went down aside from NVIDIA and uh, Broadcom. But you saw Intel, Texas, AMD all going down in the last few days. They're buying the dips on those. So it's not a rotation, but it is a new allocation of capital into the laggards. To confirm that this is indeed a conviction rotation, and it's for real, we need to see an actual rotation. We need to see profits being booked from the winners and that money moving and rotating into the losers because that shows conviction right now we have no conviction at all but we talked about some important numbers the spx the important number today was 4270 had it traded down below this number for a significant amount of time let's say 30 40 minutes an hour or so we would have seen a sell-off in the spx and the reason is it was the point where the tide of momentum shifts from call options holders to put options holders so 40 270 as you can see went down but the market maker bought right away why would the market maker do that why would the market maker defend 4270 a reminder the market maker in a nutshell is doing covered calls they buy the spx way down at the four thousands and then they keep selling these calls when we buy them then they buy more of the underlying equity but in essence they're up with the traders so anybody long anybody has calls on the spx is making money along with the market maker now the market maker doesn't want to shift tides and start selling their spx shares in what is known as a reverse gamma squeeze unless they really have to unless there is a selling force that cracks below an important number in this case 4270 and it becomes clear the put options holders have the momentum now then the market maker has to scramble and dump spx shares and we see a sharp sell-off because now the 4240s the 4230s might become in the money and the market maker wants to hedge before that happens so they have to sell shares of the spx the hedge on the way down is selling shares the hedge on the way up is buying shares the hedge on the way down is selling shares at least from the perspective of the market maker so this is going to be an important number tomorrow but the options for today expired so we have to look for tomorrow's activities to see where the volume is heading for both calls and puts and update the numbers for now we can't talk about the spx but we can talk about the queues because 354 was the important number. Why was it important? Because if the queues trades below 354, the open interest and volume of the options traded below this number for calls is really anemic. Versus when you look at put volumes and put open interest below 354, those numbers are higher. And therefore, when we look at the five minutes chart for the queues, look at this. Every single time the chart went below 354 immediately, the market makers started buying right away. And the reason is they want to avoid getting into the position of having to induce a reverse gamma squeeze. But they can avoid all they want. At some point, it's going to hit. And perhaps it's going to happen as soon as tomorrow. When we look at the options expirations for tomorrow's activities, these are the calls. We're now trading at 354. So the 355 is out of the money. Notice the open interest below 354. The highest we have is at the 352 with about 2,000 contracts. But that's about it. Now you look at the puts, different picture. So the market maker has to immediately pump the queues above 355. Otherwise, if the queues start to slip, it goes to 353. And this is what the market maker is looking at. They have thousands and thousands of open interest contracts below. 355. To begin with, the 355 has over 9,000 contracts in the money right now. In other words, the risk for a reverse gamma in the queues tomorrow is highly likely. Which names could lead the downside in the queues? I don't know. We can look at Meta, for example. Look at Meta. I said this. If this is not topping, then it should be locked in a 6x4 cage with an Anaconda. And my insurance policy, of course, if Meta blasts higher tomorrow is... Uh, Anaconda was a euphemism for my penis. So I'm just going to be locked by myself in a 6x4 cage. There you go. But all joking aside, you look at the chart. This is the third day in a row where the chart loses momentum midday. It trades higher, then it loses momentum. So this could be the leader if there is any pullback in the queues tomorrow. 
We look at the options grid for Meta expiration date this Friday. We look at the calls, the open interest. Most of them are now out of the money. The market maker has the 270 calls with about 4,000 open interest contracts to take care of. But once that's done, rest in peace. But what happens if Meta trades below 270? We look at the puts. Look at this. The open interest is a lot higher, which means the risk for a reverse gamma squeeze in Meta is highly likely. So this is something you got to keep in mind. Now we talked about the IWM. The IWM is the strongest. It's not going to get weaker until 182 is violated. We're not even close to that right now. Anyhow, we'll talk about this and a lot more, but we have to move on to the market coverage and we begin with the closing of the indices today. And uh, here we go. The Dow Industrial Average closing positive by 10.42 points or a gain of 0.03%. The Nasdaq up by 46.99 points or a gain of 0.36%. The S&P positive by 10.06 points or a gain of 0.24%. We'll look at these sectors all in all. Again, this is the kind of thing you want to see to be more positive on the stock market. We want to see cyclicals, financials, real estate, metals, industrials, energy leading, not lagging. And we need to see money coming out of technology, coming out of communication services, and rotating into the laggards. We see some of that today, but again, as I explained, this is an allocation, new allocation of capital, not really a rotation, at least not yet. If we start to see NVIDIA going down, let's say 5 6%, if we start to see Apple going down 2 to 3%, Meta going down, Google stalling, Amazon stalling, but we see oils, metals, cyclicals, financials boosting higher. Then the managers will have FOMO and they're going to take money out of Apple's, Microsoft, Meta's, Amazon, Google's, NVIDIA's, and they're going to rotate this money into energy, metals, financials, and that would be indeed a confirmation that we are in a bull market because we have a conviction trade by the managers. This is indeed going to be a soft landing. And in this case, we have to buy the metals. We have to buy oils. We have to buy financials, industrials, especially industrials. But you and I know that the data does not support that. For this to happen, we need to see a recovery in China, a legitimate one with momentum. We need to see the recession data here in the US, in Europe, in the UK, reversing and we have yet to see any of that so the managers right now just allocating new capital into the laggards oh they squeeze two percent here five percent there eight percent and then they book the profits and they move on so for now you cannot really trust the rotation at least not quite yet with that being said the breadth was much better much better than yesterday much better than a few weeks ago the nyse 82 percent advancing versus 17 percent declining the nasdaq 72 percent advancing versus 26 percent declining we move on to futures if it is indeed a soft landing in the beginning of a new bull market then oils should be participating crude should be higher it shouldn't be under the recession threat 24 7 it shouldn't be shorted like this and the hypocrisy is you see a lot of managers and a lot of firms they go on in tv and they say oh this is going to be a soft landing we have a bull market going on right now and they go and pump big caps because if they sell the big caps to the mom and pops, this will elevate the SPX, the NASDAQ, the indices, and they will look good on paper. They will get those bonuses. But what they're not telling you is the same people who say that this is a bull market and a soft landing coming, they're buying technology. They're also shorting oil. It doesn't add up. If you believe in a soft landing, it cannot be short oil. Because if we do have an expansion phase coming and a new bull market coming, then we should see high demand for oil. But this is not the case. Pretty much every rip in oil we see it sold right away, including the latest from Saudi Arabia of uh, voluntary cuts. It faded right away. And today we see the WTI down about 1%, crude down about three quarters of a percent, likewise heating oil down about 1%, and then we have more modest advances for gasoline, our bob, and natural gas futures, both with gains of a little over half a percentage point. Mixed picture and softs, we see sugar moving higher, nothing new here, but lumber also recovering. And this is good news for the cyclical side of the market. We have some modest gains for coffee and cotton futures. But of course, the loser of the day, OJ futures, coming off elevated levels, down about 3% today. Muted reaction for metals all in all, nothing notable here. When we look at meats, meat prices are surging higher. Live cattle, feed our cattle. You have a shortage of cattle, shortage of herds. You know what you're paying for ground beef, for poultry, for steak absurd prices so either we crush the demand or maybe ai will figure out how to print more cows anyhow what about grains green across the board for the most part the exception is soybean meal down about one and a quarter percent for the day but the majority of the action was actually in wheat futures in the morning and the reason is we got the news there's a lot of conflicting uh 
accounts for what really happened in Ukraine. But somebody blew up an important dam and there was a little bit of flooding. And then we got talks and rumors that perhaps the grain deal between Russia and Ukraine will be off the table. Maybe there will be damage to some of the crops. But all of these were overblown fears, at least for now. And therefore, wheat futures closed at the lows of the day, be it positive by about half a percentage point. Moving on to the big casino, the options market, what do we see here? The volumes are receding, meaning we're seeing less chasing now, but the spreads between calls and puts are still too high. We're seeing more buying of calls, excessive buying of calls, and the premiums in a lot of these names are getting really elevated. So you see the stock like Tesla, for example, up about 1.7% today, but a lot of call options with the expiration date of this Friday actually lost money because 1.7% move in a day, that's not enough for the premiums you're paying right now. You need to see three, three and a half four percent plus for the premiums to pay so this is something you got to keep in mind when everybody stampedes and buy calls you probably want to do the opposite in any case tesla number one with about 1.8 million contracts traded today about 62 percent of those were calls apple at number two with about 1.2 million contracts traded today about 63 percent of those were calls nvidia at number three with about 850,000 contracts traded today about 60 percent of those were calls moving on to the unusual activities that took place in the options market today we begin with the ticker a FRM, a firm. Here we have somebody betting that the name will go higher and they bought the 18 bucks calls for the expiration date, July 14th, with the expectations that the name will go higher and gain more than 14% by then. They paid about one buck a piece, standard. This trade, all in all, spending about $2.2 million. Now, with Apple having the buy now, pay later service, why would anybody bother with a firm? Doesn't make sense at all. And then we have Coinbase, C O I N. Like I said, bad news. But a lot of folks are buying the dip in COIN. Here we have a speculative trade with the expiration date of Friday. So it is a lotto ticket. Somebody bought the 55 calls for the expiration date this Friday. The expectations are Coinbase will move higher and gain more than 6.5% by then. They paid about one buck a piece. Standard, this trade all in all spending about $1.7 million. And then we have the ticker DKS for Dick's Sporting Goods. And here we have somebody betting that the name will go down. Now, mind you, we have a retail apocalypse in this country, but Dix has been holding pretty good. If Dix goes down, then what do you think will happen to the Foot Lockers, to the Macy's, to the best buys of the world? They're not going to do pretty good. And here, the trader bought the 120 puts for the expiration date, August 18th, with the expectations that the name will go down and lose more than 11% of its value by then. They paid about two and a half bucks a piece, standard. This trade, all in all, spending about $3.7 million. What about the IWM? Is it indeed bottoming? In higher we go from this point on a rotation this is what one trader is betting on and they bought the 197 calls for the expiration date july 14th with the expectations that the name will go higher and gain more than seven percent by then they paid about 70 cents a piece standard this trade all in all spending about one million dollars and last but not least what about the ticker orcl oracle now if you must hold your nose and chase the ai mania this is the only name it support i would not own it even with your money but if you must chase anything in the ai mania oracle is the cheapest so somebody bought the 115 calls for the expiration date june 30 with the expectations that the name will go higher and gain more than 7% by then. They paid about one buck and 20 cents a piece, standard this trade, all in all spending about $1 million. We move on to the heat map analysis. What do we see here? We see some weakness in the big caps, Apple, Microsoft, Meta, those are the names with the most elevated RSIs. They're coming down. We see it in chips, NVIDIA, AVGO, Broadcom, those are down. But names that are not really overbought in the RSI, the Qualcomm's, the AMD's, the Intel's, the TSM's, all moving higher today. And the same goes with the big caps, the Google's, the Amazon's, they're not quite elevated yet in the RSI. The exception, of course, is Tesla. Tesla's still up today. And the reason is we got some good news, if you may. Now the Model 3 finally is qualified for the 7500 bucks in credits from the federal government playing with taxpayer money of course picking winners and losers this is capitalism for you if you're a company that produces regular cars you're not getting the credit but tesla it's a welfare company we the taxpayer we built tesla not elon musk 
We gave him the money, the funding, the tax refunds, the credits, the factory for pennies on the dollar. Tesla is a welfare company, but this was good enough of a news for the stock to move higher and gain about 2% for the day. Then we look at healthcare, that's lagging. It's a high dividend paying sector. We look at utilities, they're also lagging. We look at defensives, also down. Anything dividend paying is down. And the dips are being bought in the expansion side of the stock market. We're talking about financials, we're talking about industrials, we're talking about in metals, steel, fertilizers, the oils, the cyclical names, the hotels, casinos, airlines, all catching a bit today. Again, it is encouraging, but can you trust it? Is it reliable? We only seen it on Friday, didn't see it on Monday. Now we're seeing it again. We need to see a little more. Otherwise, the money managers are going to run out of new capital they just got for the month if it's already deployed. They need more capital. And the majority of capital is stuck in the Apples, the Microsoft, the NVIDIAs, the Metas. So they have to sell those to continue to buy the dips and the losers. Or it could be a transitory rotation, a fake-out operation. And next thing you know, we see regional banks down big, industrials down, metals, oils crashing. So for now, I would say it is encouraging. But can you bid on the rotation? A lot of you said, hey, Maverick. Can I short the queues by the IWM, for example? Can I short technology and go along industrials, for example? Too early for that. If you're going to do any of that stuff, use options. Use call options to buy the dips and the losers. Use put options to fade the rips on the winners. But I would not chase by allocating new capital in my portfolio buying metals or specialty banks. Not right now. But if you give it a little more, if this rally in banks continue for a little more, and we start to hear, oh, the Fed is going to pause. Next thing you know, the Fed is going to cut. So the financial crisis is behind us now. And we start to see mania in banks a lot of call options buying, then again, you're going to see the rotation because money has to come out of something to chase the mania in banks. But until we see that, until we see the beginning signs of that happening, we cannot really bet on it. Financials remain as a dangerous investment right now. When we look at the heat map for the ETFs, what do we see here? Much better breadth. We see the IWM small caps leading while we see large cap growth lagging. We've also seen mid caps and value stocks participating. That's very good. And we see the X XRT, for example, retail up over 3% for the day. We see the KRE up almost 5% for the day. XME up about 2.5% for the day. The oils are up. So what's not to like here? Maybe the XLV healthcare is down because it is considered as a defensive sector of the stock market, high dividend paying names. The same goes for the XLU utilities and the XLP defensives. And of course, technology, the XLK was dormant, doing nothing at all. In other words, folks, I'll take the action today. It's a lot better than we've seen before. I'll take Friday's action, I'll take this action, but I'm still not betting on it. Let's do some charts and then wrap it up when we begin with SPY, the S&P 500, 30 minutes chart, what do we see here? It is consolidating right now, that's all there is, asking for buyers. If the rotation and the cyclicals continue, then we're going to find buyers. And the SPY will make it above 430. But if the buyers don't show up, then the sellers are gonna. If you bought banks, industrials, the metals on Friday, you're up right now. But what if they go down a little bit? What if they stall? What if the talk about a rotation fades away as we get a new piece of data? Then little by little, a lot of managers would say, okay, we made... 5% a killing in a short amount of time. In metals, we've made 7% in industrials. We made 9% regional banks in about a week or so. Let's book profits and move on. Then the buyers are not going to show up in the SPY and down it goes. It could go all the way down to closing the gap. It could go down all the way to 420. But if those waiting on the sidelines do show up, and we see more momentum in the cyclical side of the stock market. It's going to make it above 430. We look at the daily chart for the continuous contract for the S&P. What do we see here? I need to see a little more before I put in the bull flag sticker. I can put it right now, but we only have two candles. I need to see a third or at least I need to see a crack above 4,300. We know that the RSI and the MACD indicators are not overbought yet in the SPY. That's the good news, meaning there is more room to go here in the SPY. And the assumption could be money managers will continue to buy the cyclical side of the stock market, be it a rotation or new allocation, all the way till the Fed meeting. And then the SPY becomes overbought too. And between us, I'm hoping for this scenario. I'm hoping for the SPY to become really overbought in the RSI, along with the NASDAQ. Then the pullback becomes pretty much 
clutch on the back. It's not going to be a pullback as in a tick. It's going to be a massive flush down. It's going to be sort of uh, sell the news whether the Fed announces a pause or if CPI, PPI is surprised to the upside, markets are going to start to scramble to adjust expectations. And with that comes a big flush down and that will be even more supported if the SPY rallies between now and then and create those overbought conditions. When we look at the Qs, 30 minutes chart, what do we see here? We have an uptrend and now the uptrend stalled. Not a lot of damage here. The Qs is still holding at 354. No major support loss but boy if the reverse gamma takes place as i am anticipating we could see the cues down to 350 349.15 my support line but even with that it's not going to be an actual reversal yet it needs confirmation but the good news is between 349.15 and let's say the next legitimate support line is a massive gap a no man's land which could mean a flush down from 349.15 all the way to the next support which is not even on the map right now it goes up must come down here's the daily chart for the continuous contract for the nasdaq what do we see here above 14,455 that's the good news the bad news is the momentum indicators are topping and they're about to go down we have what it appears to be a double doji pattern which usually precedes a massive move the move could be up or could be down it history says if the double doji appears in a downtrend it marks the change in time from bearish to bullish if on the other hand the double doji happens in an uptrend that it marks the change in tide from bullish to bearish it is a sell signal awaiting confirmation and the confirmation if i'm right if i'm if my reading is right that we could see a reverse gamma squeeze tomorrow you combine this with a double doji you have a lot of evidence for this case that we could see a flush down in the queues tomorrow and again folks i'm not talking about Oh, the Qs went down 10%. I'm talking the Qs went down one and a quarter percent, maybe one and a half percent, but it is a beginning of a sell-off process. You see, the market gives us pieces of puzzle every single day. It's our job to put the pieces together and come up with a rational conclusion of what the market is trying to say. In this case, if I put it all together, the double dojis, the reverse gamma, the potential for it, I should say, what's going on with meta, the prospects of a rotation, you put it all together, the Qs, doesn't look good right now the cues looks as it's heading for a sell-off and maybe the sell-off will be good for this one the iwm the russell 2000 look at this massive day it caught so many support lines 179.10 182 183 it even tested 185 couldn't make it above that but here comes the problem is it too exhausted right now if it goes down to 183 and then rebounds no problem if it goes down to 182 and rebounds no problem if it goes down 179.10 we got a problem i want you to watch the cues versus the iwm if the cues start to go down iwm rallies higher we have a rotation we got a confirmation but if the Qs goes down along with the IWM, we got a problem because there is no rotation. And instead, there is a bigger prospect for an inclusive sell-off across equities, including the IWM and the Qs. We look at the Dixie four hours chart for the dollar. What do we see here? We got a retest at 103.4. Then we got a rebound and perhaps we're seeing a formation of a bull flag pattern. The dollar went higher in a retest of the top of the breakdown candle. Could it make it today? But could it find the energy to move higher? The answer is absolutely. For now it made a higher low or awaiting a higher high. Why would the dollar move higher even though Jerome Powell said he's going to pause or skip or whatever? Maybe because the data will show more inflation. And ladies and gentlemen, the most important point here is Every single meeting so far this year, every single one of them, we got to the FOMC knowing exactly what's going to happen because Jerome Powell followed the book. Whatever the odds said, he followed. What if he has to change last minute? Meaning, next week CPI comes out hot, PPI comes out hot. Yet the odds were for expectations or for pause. Then Powell comes out in the meeting and says, whoops. I just saw the CPI and the PPI. They look ugly. Inflation is about to go higher again. Nope, not doing it. Let's do 25. This will rattle the market, even though it's just another 25. It's nothing new here. It's already been accounted for. If you're looking at the two-year yield, for example, which we're going to look at in a minute, but it is defying expectations. It is the surprise element that rattles the stock market. The lack of predictability, I should say. Another scenario is if the CPI comes out hot, PPI comes out hot, retail says whatever data comes out hot. And the odds, if you look at the Fed watch tool, the odds for 25 basis points becomes the consensus among economists. 50% plus. Then Powell comes out, despite all of that, and says, oh, I'm going to pause. I'm going to skip. That will rattle the stock market too, because it goes against expectations. And in either scenario, we will see a sharp move in the dollar. 
and this will dictate what's going on with gold. For now, gold appears to be bottoming. You look at the hour side, it is firming up. You look at the MACD indicator, it is crossing, producing positive impressions in the histogram. A little baby tiny one, but it is in the process of doing so. And so long as it keeps 1928 as support, so far so good. But are we out of the woods yet? Can you buy it right now? The answer is absolutely not. You can't do that until the FOMC is out of the way. And the same goes for the SLV. Yes, it is oversold, rebounding, holding support, 21.5. 57. The momentum indicators, the RSI, the MACD, all looking better than gold. And I favor silver over gold. The problem is, can you buy it right now? If the answer is yes, you're going to buy it or short it, then you must have the answer in the bag of what's going to happen to the dollar. And the answer is you don't have that in the bag. You're not going to have it until Powell is out of the way. So why not wait for Powell? Here's Brent oil. We have the triple bottom going on right now. So far, so good. But we need a close above 77 by the end of the week. This is too risky now. This could be the process of an ABC pattern. This is what the bulls are waiting for. But if we do have another closing below 77 for the week, again, I'm patient. I'll wait till the triple bottom is violated before I go out and say, ah, we're done. No more oil, folks. And we might even think about shorting it if that happens. But we're not there yet keyboard yet we look at the two-year yield what do we see here inconclusive it could go either way we could see a massive break above 4.59 we could see a massive flush down too for now i can't read the chart it could go either way tlt what do we see here another retest at the top of the consolidation zone and we have a bounce the hour size firming up along with the macd it could be an abc pattern for the tlt but again too risky it could go either way we have to wait for pound vix four hours chart what do we see here we're not seeing higher lows and higher highs anymore what we're seeing is a flush down a capitulation when it comes to volatility nobody wants to buy puts anymore you see it is tricky doing technical analysis on the chart of the vix and and the reason is it tracks put options with 30 days plus till expiration and it tracks them on the SPY, the SPX for the most part. If we have a lot of folks who are saying, okay, my puts are probably going to expire out of the money now, they're already out of the money and I have till September or October and I got the, um, I don't know, 4,000 puts, 3,800 puts on the SPX. I don't see that happening right now. So I'm going to close these puts and maybe switch to calls. If that is the mentality, then the VIX is going to crash. And it is crashing right now because we see a lot of evidence of that happening. Look at the open interest for puts, for example, with longer expiration dates. They're going down while we see open interest for short-term calls moving higher. In other words, it could be a sign of uh, complacency. And complacency means when everybody's buying calls, betting that the market will go higher and they don't need hedges anymore. They're going naked. In this phase, we see the dumb money buying while the smart money booking profits. And we see the VIX crashing. Right now it is at 14. It could go to 13 and a half, 13. And if that happens, then we have a sign of extreme complacency in the market right now. We'll look at Apple, the big kahuna, an hourly chart. What do we see here? We got the nasty reversal from uh, the goggles. That will change the world. But you have to pay, what, uh, 4000 for them? Anyways, the chart now forming a bear flag pattern. And it might go down, and it needs to go down frankly speaking. It needs to go down to 177 as support, retest that, see what happens. If it holds, it holds. If it doesn't, down we go. The second support, closing the gap at 175.38. Then we see what happens. Tesla, an hourly chart, what do we see here? The pattern of higher highs and higher lows continues. Kind of. Today we got a higher low. That's the good news. The bad news is we did not get a higher high. It appears that Tesla is stalling here. And if it does stall, it consolidates for a little bit. That would be the distribution phase of the recent leg higher. Now, if you don't know what distribution means, look it up. It means the profit taking stage before the stock does a 180. So keep that in mind. Now, if the chart does another higher high, then so far so good. But if this high sticks and we have consolidation, watch out. Last but not least, Bitcoin tulips. What do we see here? We have a rebound, a reversal. Are we good to go right now? The answer is not really. We're back into the consolidation zone. That's all there is. And these kind of false breakouts and breakdowns, they kind of tell us ahead of time what's about to happen. So we got a false breakout to the upside, which means the actual break should be to the downside. So for all you know, today we got a rebound. Bitcoin is back into the consolidation zone. Tomorrow, we see Bitcoin flushing down, losing support at 26,555. I don't trust it right now. I don't see this as a reversal. I need to see more. For now, I think it could be a trap. Anyhow, moving on to the conclusion of this video, what do we have on the economic calendar tomorrow? Not much. We have the trade deficit and consumer credit. 
And again, if you happen to be a member on Discord, we're probably, absent of a crazy thing happening, we're probably not gonna have a morning brief tomorrow. The morning brief is already done here, but we're gonna have a midday update instead. But until then, folks, this is all I got for you for now. Thank you for listening, thank you for watching, and I will talk to you again tomorrow. Take care. Can you take the two on the right? Kid, there's something I think I ought to tell you. I never shot anybody before.